So how was how was that like pro culture uh, in regards to your development while you was there at UCLA and like what kind of things were you doing? You had a chance to play against a lot of pros and stuff like that and the open teams yeah, and stuff. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely there. Uh, you know, in the summer Rico Hines runs, it was really popping. My years, 2018, 2019, you get to really see like these is normal people, like people you playing against that everyone idolizes. Normal people, like I seen Bron come in there and like do some stuff I've never seen before. Like, this is LeBron James. I also seen LeBron come in here and lose three straight games and walk off the court. Like, you just, these is normal people, everyday people. So that's cool to see too. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to the Role Player Podcast. We took a little holiday hiatus. I hope everybody enjoyed the Thanksgiving. I know I did. Got to spend it at the crib for the first time in 11 years, man. You know, I came back. Got lined up just right. I'm looking, you know what I'm saying? I got my co-host with me. I am Jordan Taylor, by the way, just if, just in case y'all forgot. I got my co-host with me, the one and only Stanford gentleman, Switch Culture CEO, co-founder, and 11-year overseas vet, the one and only Anthony Goods. What's good with you, man? What's happening? Hey, man, congratulations on your first lineup of the season. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you've been looking, you've been looking real dusty on here, man. Yeah. You've been hey, looking dusty, I was, man. I, I was down bad, though. I couldn't even say nothing either. I ain't have no options. I went and got my hair cut one time in Romania and had to listen to the whole story of Wakanda. And dude didn't even know he was talking about Wakanda the, time, the whole time, man. But no, it was a legit, it was a legit story about an African city. It was actually kind of dope to hear, but. I'm back, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you know you gonna hold me down too long. Nah. I'm back, man. <laughs> and you know, as as y'all know, we still rocking with the good folks over at Swiss Cultures. You can check this out on Eurohoops.net as well, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you get your podcast, man. But and we got a very special guest with us today. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We've been I think we've been talking about getting this getting this man on here for a long time. Uh, second team all pack twelve in 2019, former UCLA Bruin. McDonald's All-American in 2017, second round pick to the Los Angeles Clippers back in 2019, and just an overall, just an overall superstar man coming up, man. We got the one and only Jalen Hands. Jalen, appreciate you joining us, man. How you guys doing, man? It's a little over here. Man, we good, man. We good. It's 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 been a minute. Me and Ant been. I, matter of fact, we talked about offline. I I saw you. I wasn't gonna say nothing, but I saw you over at that tournament in Athens. I saw you hoop, and I, that was the first time I got to see you play in person. So we've been talking about getting you on here, uh, getting you on here for a minute. So glad you could finally pull up, man. Yes, sir. It's nice to be here, man. No doubt, no doubt. We got a lot to cover, so we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, obviously, you're the num number three point guard in your class, man. So we want to give people, uh, give people the background for those that may not know who you are. I know most do. Uh, number three player in your class, coming out of high school, McDonald's All American. You chose UCLA, uh, obviously, come being a being a California kid. Uh, just break it down for us real quick. What what went into your decision to choose UCLA over the other options? Uh, like you said, I was a California kid. My parents are from LA. Uh, I remember my dad telling me stories about how big UCLA was back in the day, uh, and still is. So that kind of was indoctrinating in me. And then you know, from a basketball standpoint, it made sense. You know, the coach uh, really liked me. Uh, the team was needed some guards, and they were uh, playing very well. So I decided to go over there. It's a really easy decision for me. I think I committed like sophomore year of high school, so that was easy for me. Yo, real quick, I, 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 we got to we got to switch the let's switch the gears one second. What made you decide to go to Wisconsin, Jordan? As a good <laughs> as a good man. basketball player, <laughs> and as a black man, and as a black man that claims to be somewhat conscious. What made you decide to go to Wisconsin? <laughs> first of all, first of all, you say claims to be somewhat conscious. Ain't no claim. I'm a Black Panther of the Midwest, bro. Like, <laughs> nah, man. That's a good question. Honestly, I get that question a lot. My mom is from Racine, Wisconsin, right? So my family is from, from Milwaukee area. But when I went there, when I went on the visit, I didn't know what the swing offense was. I didn't know. Oh my, I, I didn't know that. nothing. I was like 16. And you know, back in those days, and Jalen, you're probably too young for this. But when we was getting recruited, Cats wasn't really looking at like the system like that. Like you was looking at, are you going to play? And you know what I'm saying? Can you, can you parlay this into maybe the league or some money afterwards? It wasn't like, oh, am I going to, you know, play this many ball screens? Am I going to be able to play alongside this guy's month? 
it was like, damn, I got a scholarship. I can hoop and I'm gonna figure it out. That's that's really what it was to a degree. But I went to a football game, man. I went to a football game. I seen some girls. I saw the <laughs> campus and I said, this looks good. Like it sounds good to me. I'll make I can make a shake. And then my dad, he broke down the. Uh, he actually did break down the. Um, uh, how many people were there? Like he broke down who was going to be a junior when I was a freshman. Mm-hmm. Who, you know, he did break that down for me and all that. So I was like, all right, come on, Power Five, Big Ten, I can get it done. All right, you know what I'm fair saying? Enough, fair what enough. What made you choose Stanford? So you over here talking about what Stanford? Like Stanford, Stanford, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, what I mean, Stanford? I mean, Stanford is Stanford is Stanford. I mean, yeah, it's the Harvard of the West. Um, you know what I mean? And uh, at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, at the time, at the time, man, it was uh, it, it was it was a it was a it was a no brainer for me. They was number one in the nation when I committed. They was a, that was a thirty and zero year years ago, back when Jay Chill and them was there. So, um, and then when you start thinking about kind of like you said, you think about like playing and all that other stuff. There's a lot of job security, you know. Little dummies in Wisconsin ain't coming right. over here taking my job. So you know what I, mean? I, I, I knew once I got there and I got on the court, I ain't got to look over my shoulder. I could get these FGAs up, and uh, you know I'm a volume shooter, so uh, it was an easy decision. That's crazy. UCLA, you got one two years. Yeah, That's, nah, for you sure. You got UCLA. You got. <laughs> hey, the funny thing was, I took a, um, I took a visit to UCLA, and I remember that was that was a year Jordan Farmar was a freshman and. Uh, it was Jordan Farmer was getting ready to come in with Aaron Aflaw. That's when they had a big class. And Jordan was in the office. And uh, Jordan was like, bro, you better uh, – he's like, man, you better sign now, man. We about to go to the Final Four. And UCLA was trash <laughs> at the time. I was like, man, get the fuck out of here. Like, whatever. Man, as soon as I got there, bro, three years in a row, man, Final Four, Final Four, Final Four. I was like, yo. That's crazy. Jordan went lying, bro. <laughs> yeah, they about, had it boom. about eight eight pros later too. Oh, eight yeah. pros later, like man, bro. That eight is... pros later. Nah, you said late. We was yeah. also. I'm a, this, this is where I'm gonna leave it at. But we was also number one before I committed. We was a uh, AP number one tied with Ohio State. You know they had a Lando Tucker. No, it was hot. It was cold right. right. for a minute. I remember watching that. Yeah, I, I I ain't gonna hold y'all. Like we play. Listen, Wisconsin plays slow, but if you break it down, like everything principally, we all we we win. And all the principles we have are modern day NBA principles. Okay. Hey, right, look, y'all, no, y'all, y'all, look, no, y'all, y'all look good on Wikipedia, is what you're saying. Y'all look good on Wikipedia. What I see on TV, what I see on TV on the court, I don't want no parts of that. On Wikipedia, it looks good. You got some pros. You know what I mean? Everybody's hey. successful, the coach, all hey. that other stuff. Wikipedia looks good. But we know. Hey, did Wisconsin play Stanford recently? Look, we ain't talking about that. So, Jalen. Right, okay, <laughs> okay, then. Okay, then. Okay, then. Nah, but. So, look, man. <laughs> yeah, we ain't talking about that. We ain't talking about that. Yeah, we, we, we here to talk. We here to talk Jalen, man. So, look, look, I know a lot of. We didn't we didn't have the hype that you had. You know what I'm saying? We talking about why we made the decision we made. We ain't had the hype that you had. UCLA would have been a dream school in mine. So, tell us, man, about going to UCLA. That brings a lot of pressure, right? Brings with it, like you said, you got one to two years, and on top of that, you being as highly ranked as you were, you you got the moniker Baby Westbrook coming out, right? So at one point, so it's like, what what does what does that do to your mindset, like having that type of um, expectation and pressure to have that type of nickname, and then uh, also have to go perform? Uh, you know, it's pretty interesting, uh, especially for me. I think my parents, uh, I got a tight family. That's just me, and my sister. Uh, my mom, my dad, obviously extended family, aunties and stuff. But, uh, you know, they're a little bit old school in way to the fact that they weren't big on social media, stuff like that. So all the kind of like social media stuff that I got wasn't ever super like big in my head or uh, like a, a big, a big deal to me. Um, my parents were more so like, you know, you can hoop, you can play basketball, you got to offer to UCLA. Like my dad actually wanted me to go to Stanford, to be honest with you. Um, I remember I got my first offer from... USC, but before that, I got some interest from Point Loma Nazarene in ninth grade, and my dad almost lost his mind. He's like, you got to offer to a school, like by the beach, like you got to take that. Like, so I think, I think, uh, you know, for me, it was just more so, it, it didn't affect me as much because it was more so, you know, go to school, uh, do what you can do, try to parlay it to the league. I didn't even know back then, like overseas options. So uh, for me, I don't think the hype was ever too big for me. Uh, it was pretty interesting when I got there my first year because it was a little rough my first year uh, to see how, um, you know, expectations and how serious it was at UCLA. 
Um, my second year, I did good, but we didn't win as much. But I think, you know, it all just goes into, like, the story of, like, you know, coming up and, you know, getting getting able to feel things, getting able to see different things. I think it was a hell of a ride for me. So it's pretty interesting. Yo, I think, like, there's – regardless of how well UCLA is doing, I feel like there's always a pro culture around UCLA, especially, like, with the open gyms being right there, like – all the NBA players come through there, you know, at a certain point. Um, so how was how was that, like, pro culture uh, in regards to your development while you was there at UCLA? And, like, what kind of things were you doing? You had a chance to play against a lot of pros and stuff like that and the open yeah, teams and stuff? Yeah, it's, it's definitely there. Uh, you know, in the summer, Rico Hines runs. It was really popular my years, 2018, 2019. Uh, I remember going to class at, like, what, 10? Go to class at 10, come back to the gym, do a lift at 12. I'll go to, to the to the gym and Russell Westbrook and, and Paul George and KD is in the gym. Like, I just got out of class a second ago. I'm, it's, it's a wild experience. You know, we was over there getting our ass whooped every day. Uh, we go back to the locker room arguing. Uh, so that was crazy. And, you know, when you're there, you get to see people that's been there, like Baron Davis, obviously Russell Westbrook. Um people like that, you know, giving you information, you know, it's kind of like a, a thing there. Like, you know, you want to come in here, do your thing and get out. So it's definitely something you feel there, like the pro, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. And nah, I remember, uh, I remember when I was in college, I came back in the summer and was hooping and uh, <laughs> we were playing like going up and down. Paul Pierce walked in, do rag, literally walked in, threw his keys against the wall. Like I'm on. <laughs> like the yeah. game stopped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like the game stopped. I don't know who got off the court, man, but I'd never forget that day, man, because it was just like, I mean, that was back when Paul was like, he was like a superstar, man. But uh, I mean, you know, and I just remember like just being there and just playing and just thinking like, yo, like it, it, it's got to be special, man, to be able to kind of get this on a consistent basis. You know, in the summer, man, I, I imagine it just does a lot for, number one, your confidence, but also your development, you know what I mean? Yeah, you get to see, like, you get to really see, like, these is normal people. Like, people you're playing against that everyone idolizes normal people. Like, i seen Bron come in there and, like, do some stuff I've never seen before. Like, this is LeBron James. i also seen LeBron come in there and lose three straight games and walk off the court. Like, you just, these is normal people, everyday people. So that's cool to see, too. Man, so speaking of development, you've seen, like you said, you've seen everything, right? Pretty much for, for a 23-year-old, you've seen a lot a lot of basketball at the highest level. That being said, what do you think, from a personal from a personal level, what do you think it is that you need to improve on most to get to, to the highest level of your game and also playing level as well? So whether that's the NBA, EuroLeague, whatever your goal is, what, what do you think those uh, steps need to be? I think coming out of college, decision-making, uh, size, and shot consistency was my biggest three areas. Uh, I think I took took care of size by now. Decision making has gotten a lot better, but it still can get way more better. Um, my shot consistency has been pretty good, especially this year. Um, so now I think for me, it's just getting at levels and spots where I can just showcase myself. Um, but right now, if I had to pinpoint something, I'd probably say just consistent decision making, be able to make the right play like every time, whether it's scoring 20, 25, or Maybe I scored 12 and had eight boards and six assists, didn't turn over, played great defense. So I think just that that consistency and decision-making and just literally just being at the right spot at the right time. So you see you see yourself more as like a point guard than a, than a two guard or a cop? Like what, what, how would you classify your positionally if you had to? In Europe, I think I'm definitely a combo guard. Uh, I can definitely play point, you know, at times. Uh, especially if I'm feeling it, but I think I'm at best when I'm playing alongside someone. Um, I think in the, the States, it's really a little bit more positionless. And so I don't think it's really a deal of, you know, point guard, two guard. Uh, but in Europe, since it's a lot more technical, I can play point uh, for periods of times, and maybe even a game or two, but I think I'm at best playing alongside someone. That's a problem. That's a, one thing we talked about a lot on this show is kind of, uh, like what, how to bring value, I guess, to a position, right? So, I mean, good, you can answer this too. But I guess even though the even though the NBA is positionless now, I still feel like it's something that you gotta find. You have to find something to hang your hat on, whether it's a shot maker, defender, decision maker. 
So I guess from from your standpoint, and good, you can answer this too. What as a guard, what brings the most value to an NBA team? From my from my from my opinion, I think anyone under six five is you know a little bit on the smaller side for the NBA. So I think if you're on the smaller side, you have to bring creation. You have to be able to defend one through three at least, and you have to obviously make shots. And it's crazy because that's that's something that a lot of guys can do more than people would think. So I think it's a lot to do with literally timing and being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I think too, it's, uh, I feel like a lot of guys can make shots, but can you make shots at the right time? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you see it, you see it a lot of times where, you know, you could look at, you know, even shooters, you could look at a guy that's like an amazing shooter and then, he gets into a game and obviously he's not the focal point. You know, he may not touch the ball for eight minutes and then he's got to make a shot or two. And then over the course of six games, like his percentages look trash and then he ends up getting cut. But I think that, you know, a lot of times, I mean, the game is simple. It's about putting the ball in the basket, right? But um, for whatever reasons, man, I think it's, it's, it's definitely difficult, especially when you're a scorer and then you got to, you get reduced to, you know, a role where you're getting those four shots is like, how do you go out there and make sure that you're making three of those four and then st staying in the game long enough to make it to six or eight shots? You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, there's a, it's a, it's a tough code to crack, man, because there's, like you said, there's so many guys under six, five that can kind of do the same thing. So it's like, how do you stand out? And, you know, usually you either got to be a hell of a shooter, be a microwave or, you got to do something, but every player has to be able to kind of showcase, okay, what is your NBA skill? And um, I think that's where that's where it's tough when you got these guys that are jack of all trades. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Man. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think to, to your point, Jalen, you said you got to guard one through three as a six, five or under six, five guard. Like the NBA is all about adaptability. Like at this point, cause everybody, there's a lot of dudes who could play. There's a lot of dudes who could put in the basket, a lot of skilled players, but it's like, how do you adapt to the situation you in? I think part of adapting to the situation you in comes with reps and comes with time. And someone's got to allow you to adapt at the same time, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, I've seen you, you know, you, I think you famously had kind of back and forth with like Colin Sexton uh, at one point, right? You know, you competed against the Trey Youngs. You, you don't, again, you don't competed against all these guys. So in y'all's opinion, like what's the, what, you know, what's the difference between some of like what makes Colin Sexton, y'all probably got the same, same amount of talent, right? So what makes someone like Colin Sexton allows him to kind of flourish and get more and more opportunities Versus some guys who, you know, might not get the same opportunity, might not get the same uh, leeway, the same leash. What do you think is the difference in that despite the despite the similar talent levels? Uh, I think that really goes back to timing. I think uh, Colin is how he's, I think Colin's body was more developed in the high school. I think Colin had a more defined game in high school. So when he got to college, I don't know what he averaged, but I know he did great. Um, and that kind of parlayed him to his NBA career where he kind of had that space to be a high draft pick and, you know, get in there and make mistakes and uh, learn and, you know, eventually blossom to the great player he is. Uh, Trey, same thing, a little bit more defined game. Went to a situation in Oklahoma where he got the ball. Every possession, you obviously got to have the talent to back that up. But, um, you know, the timing of that for him to go, he was top five draft pick, I believe. Uh, get a situation where he gets the ball and, you know, they allow him to grow and do this and do that. Uh, you know, I think that kind of speaks to timing and in place. Um, those are two great players. Uh, so I think that gives them a chance to, like I said, to, 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 to expand their game in the NBA setting. Um, yeah, grow. Right. You know, for me, I went to college. I didn't do what they did. So when I got drafted 56, I went to a kind of wild situation with the Nets. And I didn't kind of get that chance. So uh, we went different paths, you know, stuff a little different ways. Uh, and that goes for a lot of people that don't even have the chance, you know, get on a podcast like Switch Cultures and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff where it just doesn't go the right way. And you kind of have to, you know, navigate through different things. So it's a it's a it's a crazy game. What what were you what did you get told? Because, you know, freshman and sophomore, you obviously improved in your sophomore year. So coming out, like, what was what were some of the things you were hearing? Because I think 
y your stock technically was higher freshman year. Like, if you would have left your freshman year, you probably would have gone higher, right? So maybe, maybe no, not. I, don't know. I wasn't. I didn't have a good freshman year. Okay, so, but th despite the fact that you improved from freshman to sophomore year, what were some of the things you were told coming out, um, coming into the league? I got told kind of the position question, or you're one or two. Um, if you're a two, you know, you're, what are you, 170? Uh, can you guard one through three? Yeah. Okay, if you're a one, can you consistently make good decisions? Uh, we don't know that. Um, but what, what does he have? You know, he can shoot. He can get in the paint. He's a little quick. Uh, he has size right now that can you know he can build into his body through years to come. Uh, pretty much what I heard. Man, that's dope. You you, you got that self aware approach, man. Like you sound like you just love the game. You trying to improve every day. You know, it's not like it's, it's tough to take criticism and uh, and apply it to your game. You know what I mean? So that, that's dope that you got that that you got that about uh -huh. you. Yeah, so it's just basketball at the end of the day. Yeah, nah, yeah. that's a fact, man. And I think, too, like, I mean, and, and Jordan, I'm sure you've seen it, you know, over the course of your career. I mean, I think, like, you're not a finished product at fucking 22 years old, 21. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I was telling uh, I was telling Jalen, you know, before we got on, like, by the time you get to, like, your veteran, veteran years, there's so much shit you wish you could have gave yourself. Like, that you know, true. if I knew this shit at 23, 24, I like, that, you know what I mean? It would have been different. I say that now, back then, and, at 18. Uh, facts. Right, right, exactly. So, like, you can only imagine, like, m more years playing professional yeah. basketball and just how the game, like, everybody talks about, like, the game slowing down. Like, you know, that for sure is going to happen. But I think that, you know, the way that you kind of get to those levels is, number one, being self-aware. Like, okay. Uh, I was 170. I need to go put on a little bit more weight so now I can, you know, switch, you know, a little bit more and hold my own or whatever it is or, you know what I mean? And then, okay, now I'm going to start, like, you know, working on, uh, you know, decision making. You know what I'm saying? And then once you start to complete that product, like, you might look up at 25. And now, you know, what I mean, you're a completely different player. Now, maybe you turning down NBA offers like a like a Shane Larkin and Kevin Punter and all these other guys. Like, you know, what I'm saying, like, that's yeah. you know, everybody does have like a different route. But I think like the guys that ultimately end up getting to you know that level where they are of that um, deserving of an NBA spot. And obviously, there's more NBA players than there are spots in the NBA. But um, yeah, man, I think that self-awareness is definitely key, man, because, uh, you know, everybody loves, you know, everybody going to tell you what you could do well, but, you know, really being real with yourself and knowing what you need to improve on, that's how you finish that product that, you know what I'm saying, is ultimately going to gonna get you paid, you know what I'm saying, a fact. That's and, a fact. and change your career. I agree with that. Facts. Facts. So both of y'all men that spent time in the G League and, and uh, overseas, what do y'all think the biggest difference in development styles is between the two? And what do you like and dislike about about both? Uh, wow. G League development and differences. <laughs> <laughs> so you definitely going to, in my opinion, I think you definitely develop more overseas. Um, really? Yes, I think the, the game overseas is much more technical. Well, speaking from my opinion, uh, I'm, I was always very talented, but I didn't have a lot of technicality in my game. So I think overseas for me is a lot better because the G League, you don't do a lot of you know, technical learning, but you're going up and down so much, 50, 60 games in like four or five months. You naturally go put stuff on, get, get, a, get a better feel for the NBA game. But overseas, I just think technically you get so much better, like being able to read. You know, pick and rolls. Uh, you know, the severity of each game is like times fifty-five. So every possession means more to you. Um, you know, the rigors of waking up and practicing every day hard. In the states, you're not practicing hard. In Europe, you practice hard every day. Um, you know, just mentally, you just get a toughness about you that's kind of. I think it pushes. I think it would push you further along than a, a G League step. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think I think the uh I think it develops you in different ways, man. Like I think like um if you're trying to like develop a specific skill, I think the G League 
you know, is good for that. I feel like they have better, like, skill development trainers, you know, um, like even with the assistant coaches or whoever they got there uh, on staff, like way back, you know, in ancient the ancient G League that I was in, the D League, uh, you know, <laughs> we uh, – the skill development was cool, you know what I mean? But I didn't really learn the game, you know what I'm saying? I didn't really learn, like, the strategy of a game. I didn't really know how to play pick and roll like that, like, you know what I mean? I didn't know how to uh, – defend you know all kind of different kinds of actions and stuff like that like if you if you and i'm sure i don't know if y'all y'all have had this but like i remember i remember one time just being in a game in europe and then you got like four different coverages on pick and roll depending on who got the ball it's like my first, it's my first you know what i'm saying it's like you really gotta like you really gotta be out there like thinking the game, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, if he going on his left hand, we gonna be do this and then we're gonna do that. Like it's like football, man. So I think you really start to like learn the game in a different way. Um, being in Europe and I think for all guards, I think you there's no better way if you're trying to become a better pick and roll player, man, Europe is is definitely the way to go. There's so many different coverages. Again, going back to the different coverages, um, you know, taking different things away in the different schemes, man, and just how physical they can be on the ball, I think it uh, it definitely helps you develop in that way, for sure. I'm sure uh, JT can attest to this, but, bro, I can't. This is my first year. I think we have, like, 35 to 50 plays. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, 35, 50 plays, bro? We, we had a game this last week. I, they had five different guards. We had a different coverage for four of them. In, in different plays, different plays, we had to change the coverage. <laughs> I played one game on Saturday. I played one game on Saturday where it was a a high hedge against me. We did a, a, a international game against Malaga, a team from ACB. Oh my God, defense was insane. Pressure the whole game. Then I came back to playing Greece again on Sunday, and then I was getting blitzed from the top. Like you don't even know what's going on. Like I like in the in the G, it's just one coverage, just drop every time. So it's the yeah, it's drop the, every the time. think the the, the 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 amount you have to think. Keep in mind you got like thirty year old vet guards like this guarding you. It's like it's a lot going on in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> like JT shit. To to be honest, that that's the hardest part is thinking as a guard is thinking the game while playing football. <laughs> 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 like, 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 <laughs> you over here trying to Yo. call a play. You got to handle it. Dude over here pushing the shit out. You like, God, be that, like, bro, that is, it's like, it, it really, honestly, and I, I had a question for you. Cause again, just to keep harping on, you played with some of the best talents ever. And I can't imagine the type of confidence that that would help you bring to Europe. Right. Cause it's like, there's from a, from a, a talent perspective, there's nothing in Europe that you yeah. have not seen. So it's like, I can play, but it's like, you just start seeing some shit that ain't That's even what I'm basketball. It's, it's a different thing. Like, it's a whole <laughs> different, different beast. It's it's pretty. Yeah, it's different. It's, yeah. So it yeah it, def, it definitely gives you a so it definitely gives you a swagger and a, and a confidence, man. But if you was right now, so you you in Thessaloniki uh, for for those that don't know, uh, which is in which is in Greece in the first division Greek league. Is there a team right now that you could see yourself on? on in EuroLeague or NBA that, like, what's the best fit? If you had to pick a team right now, EuroLeague or NBA or both, what's the best fit for your game right now? Uh, say wherever. <laughs> <laughs> say wherever yeah, they play. Wherever they, yeah. <laughs> what's up? But, no, nah, I like I like to get out and run. I like to get out and run. Uh, I can shoot. Uh, I can, if you need me to score 20, I can do that. If you need me to play alongside someone, I can do that. I think, like I said, Europe has really evolved my game to be able to play with a lot of people in a lot of different styles. So I think I can go pretty much, I don't know, a lot of places I wouldn't be able to go to in terms of, you know, not being able to have the skills to be successful. So I, I'll really go anywhere, to be honest with you. Yo, man, I see, uh, I see a lot of, like, I see a lot of Kevin Punter in your game. I seen, uh, I was just watching, <laughs> I was just watching KP. He's I was cold. just watching KP uh, yesterday. In, uh, Real against Real Madrid, man. And, like, obviously he's probably one of the best off-the-dribble scorers, you know, in Europe, basketball period. But I was also seeing, like, 
he does so much on the defensive end that he doesn't get credit for. Like, he rebounds. Yeah. And, like, even when he doesn't rebound, he, like, knocks the ball loose out of Big's hands. He's got, like, a knack for that. He's got great hands defensively, man. And he doesn't get credit for that because he scores the ball so well. But, man, yeah. KP, like, he's, an, he's another guy, like I said. Like, now, like, when I watch him, he is a complete product. Like, you know what I'm saying? Both sides yeah. of the ball. He can handle it. He can dish it. Like, he's – Crafty. It, oh, yeah. He, he, he's everything, man. He, no, he's, he's a hell of a player. But I see I see a lot of – I see a lot of – you guys have a similar – in a similar frame and all that other stuff. But y'all y'all have similar games for sure, man. And uh, I could definitely see you. He's yeah, cold. Yeah, not nah, for sure. Nah, he's tough. I've never – I don't think I've – I don't think I've – I've seen him in uh, L.A. this year. Uh, working out, but I don't think I've ever said a word to him. But I actually uh, read up on him because his stories uh, coming out of college and stuff. He was actually in Greece his first, I don't know if his first year or second yeah. year. Uh, I read something where he said he was about to go home and stop playing basketball and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's cool to see him, you know, come up, you know, be what he is now. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think every overseas basketball got that experience when they were. <laughs> 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 I don't know one American who wasn't really to, ready to hang it up, go work at H and R Block, dog. Do something. <laughs> hey, that's a fact. <laughs> this is, this is, man, it's bullshit. So ready to hang it up? Go start selling insurance, man. This ain't worth man, it. Man, fact. <laughs> do whatever. It's a lot of wild stuff. I can see that. Do I whatever, see that. man. But no, I, I can see you in. Uh, I can see you in. My fitting Maccabi or one of them Serbian, one of the Serbian teams, you know, where you kind of, you know, you get some freedom and just go play your game. And the the, pro, the Serbian teams, there's a lot of, they put a lot of pressure on them Americans or the Eastern European teams, but that's, you know, a gift and a curse. Hey, I'm down for whatever. Facts. Facts. <laughs> you go get there, man. Y'all, this, so with EuroLeague growing in popularity too, do y'all think that for, for us over here in Europe, do y'all think that Playing EuroLeague is a vindication of skill set or talent um, for those that aren't in the NBA. And what I mean by that is if you're a EuroLeague player, does that mean that you are an NBA-capable player? I, I don't think so, Okay, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's literally, like, it's cliche, but I think it's literally two different games. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I, I think it's two different games. I think that, shit, I, to get to EuroLeague for an American, because nine times out of ten, you start at the bottom or close to the bottom, I think it's more of a vindication of your, your drive and your will, your skill, uh, all that. And you're getting paid. So, But to the, a lot of people, I wouldn't think a lot of people that thrive, and maybe not thrive, but I think a lot of people that play international or in, in Europe, the, trans, the transition is like two different games. Yeah. No, it's definitely two different games, man. And I think, you know, we've seen it. We've seen it go both ways where, you know, guys have come from, like, EuroLeague to NBA and struggle. We've seen guys go from EuroLeague to NBA play well. And we've, yeah. seen, we've seen a lot of that vice versa, guys leaving the NBA and just not fitting in in Europe. And it's not, it's not because of a lack of skill. The player's not good or whatever it is. I think a lot of times, man, it is a completely different game. And this game may not fit your skill set. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, whatever you do well in Europe. Especially, I think, especially for guards. Yeah, yeah, especially for guards. No, my bad. Nah, my you're bad. good. But nah, especially for guards. Like, the speed is different. The length is different in the States. You know what I'm saying? The floor is different. It's crowded. The rules are different in Europe. Um, and you do have to be much more of a skilled player in Europe and, uh, you know, and think the game a little a little better. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough, man. It, but I think a lot of people just kind of, just look at it at a glance, like, oh, okay, you know, you're you're an NBA player, you should go to EuroLeague and just average fifty. Like, it's not gonna happen. You know what I mean? No. Vice not. versa. You you could be the leading scorer in EuroLeague. Don't mean you about to go to the <laughs> not don't mean you about to go to the Rockets yeah. and be an all star. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I ain't go I'm a I'ma disagree with y'all. I'ma say from an American standpoint, I think ninety eight 99% of Americans that play in EuroLeague are NBA capable. And I say that because I think that, again, Europe teaches you a lot about adaptability. You have to adapt to so many different situations in Europe, whether it's you got to score the ball, you got to, no, no, let me finish, Stanford. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. You got to score the ball. Because you got to you gotta, cause I, yeah, cause you gotta, you gotta score the ball. You might have to score the ball one year. You might have to play with a better score the next year. Whatever it is, you got you really are in a different situation every year in Europe. 
So to get to EuroLeague, that means you thriving in those situations damn near every year, to most of the years, right? So for me, it's like you done seen all that link growing up. You done seen all that athleticism growing up. So that's really, that's probably the hardest thing to adjust to, in my opinion, uh, in the NBA. I mean, obviously I haven't been there, but um, so I, I think that Americans that are in the EuroLeague, 98% of them are NBA capable. Well, I mean, I think we got to define what is NBA capable. Like, yeah, surviving an NBA Can practice, cracking a rotation, nah, nah, nah. cracking a rotation. No, 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 no. I didn't say crack a rotation because you know there's a lot that goes into cracking a rotation now. Right. But what I'm saying is they get on the floor and they'll be they'll, they'll look good. They'll thrive. They'll be all right. You know what I'm saying? They'll be yeah. I, I just I, I, I have it, to man. disagree with that. I, you can I think you can be a I think you can be a six eight center. In, in in Europe at thirty five, if you know how to play and be be pretty good, if you go to the NBA, like the, you can't. Come on, you, you can't. can't. Do that. I'm not saying that the six eight thirty five year old center ain't good because he's really good. It's just literally two. And in the athletic field, like you talking about someone specifically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about no one specifically. I'm just giving it. I'm just giving an example, bro. I'm just giving an example. I'm just giving an example. Just like, just like the NBA, I think, I think someone that's all athleticism, not really no shot, no no handle. I mean, if you a big, maybe you can come to your your league and be surf just because you six eleven and running. But if you a guard that can't shoot, really handle or think, you just athletic. You come to your league, it, it might be clipped. Mm -hmm. Like I, it, it's it might tough. look crazy. It's gonna be tough for sure. But so I, I, I just think it's two different games. See, I, I to to a degree, but I, I said ninety eight percent. So yeah, if you a six eight center, you're gonna struggle. But specifically, I think a lot of like, who are the guards? Who are the American guards in Euroleague right now? Like, who do you, who comes to mind when you think of the American guards? You think of Mike James? I mean, these are the elite of the elite, of course. Right. Mike big, James, okay, okay, Mike James can play in the NBA. Mike he James, can play in the NBA. Shane Larkin. Uh, but I'm think like even you look at a team like Basconia, Marcus Howard, uh, who's in. Okay, we talking about you talking Berlin, about you talking Steven, about the top Berlin. guys. You talking about the top guys. You're, you're I, I one through take five. It, take it to give me 96, 97, 98. 96, 97, 98. Let's talk about them. Where are they? At? <laughs> All right, who's who's in who's in last place? Who's in last place in the in the Euro League right now? You had you had Peyton Siva in Berlin, who was a bottom tier, like a lower lower level team in Euro League, mm -hmm. but he's was NBA capable for certain. Right, he was he was NBA capable. I think. Uh, Okay, let's just look at the – let's just look – just to be fair, let's look at last place. Thing. Okay, Milan. Milan's in last place right now. Nobody. Kevin Pangos. Kevin Pangos. Okay, he let's look at – He was in Cleveland the, last year. Billy Barron. Billy could play. I don't know him. No, nah, Billy could – I think I, I've been a, I've been a big-time Billy Barron fan. The way Devin, Billy can Devin shoot Hall. the ball, like he might be a little undersized. And you, like, you can just look Bills. at it like – now nowadays, and I think look, Devin's nice. Devin's nice. We used to, the the games are different, right? Like mm -hmm. the the pace is different and all that. We used to have a saying at Wisconsin though, <laughs> you know, the game really doesn't change. Basketball is basketball, so I am like, yes, games. The game is different, but at the end of the day, good basketball players can adapt. Right. And like running, it's not like you can't run up and running up and down the court dealing with that. Are you gonna go dunk on someone in the NBA the way you gonna go dunk on someone in your league? No. But are you going to find a way to put the ball in the hoop or be effective? Yeah, because basketball is still basketball at the end of the day. Like, you might not be a dude who can go get 20 in the NBA the way you can in Europe or 15, but you well, can yeah, find that, a way to be I successful. think that's the – I thought that was the question. Like, are you going to just make a smooth transition to the NBA because you did – I don't think – Yeah, you know. No, I said, can you be NBA capable? Can a, can NBA you, capable. Can a, a EuroLeague Euro player figure out how to be serviceable in the NBA? Hell yeah, it's a EuroLeague right. player. Yeah, we on the same page, you know what I'm saying? Nah, but I'm thinking you're talking okay, about like so cracking rotation. Different question. Like, you put him on a team. And yeah, like you're talking about something different. Cracking yeah. rotation. Like I mean, shit, Mike minutes. James had a tough time cracking a rotation. So I'm just talking about from a okay. – like, I'm just talking about – from a uh, from a playing stand eye test, we just do an eye test. Take out all the politics. Take out all the var the variables. That yeah, any in. any Euroleague player will be able to find a way to be serviceable. And like yes, definitely mm -hmm. Euroleague player. All right. That's that's not that's not that's not everybody has that opinion though. That's what I'm saying. A lot of people would disagree. Say that's not true. So, so they must not watch or know Euroleague. Yeah. <laughs> not, a lot of people don't watch Euroleague games for real, especially <laughs> in the states. So it's like mm -hmm. it's it is a. Uh, it's a fine line. But, yeah, so we on the same page then. Good. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad I could teach y'all something. Yeah. 
Go ahead. <laughs> go, go ahead. Hit that culture question, man. <laughs> yeah, nah, man. But uh, it's funny, man. So there was, uh, you know, obviously we're coming off the heels of Thanksgiving, and uh, Zion refused to uh, he refused to reveal what he was going to eat for Thanksgiving because he was, you know, he, he didn't want the backlash from social media. He said something along the lines of like, oh, you're trying to set me up. Like, if, no matter what I say, social media is going to kill me. <laughs> and I, I think it's uh, yeah. I think it's funny that we have like these, you know, the biggest stars are, you know, thinking about social media and like the backlash that it can bring. So it's like, you know, what effect does social media have on like the biggest stars today? Like, do you think that they, do you think a lot more of them really care about it than than not, and do you think that they should? Uh, I mean, shoot, I think a lot more people definitely do. I was on Twitter yesterday and seen Michael Thomas, like a Saints receiver, talking about stuff from like three years ago. So, like, I think it definitely got an effect on people. Do I think it should? No, <laughs> I don't get it, bro. Like, it's like, I mean, I get like you don't want people talking about you, but at the end of the day, like, what you expect people to do, like. People talk, like, people talk, people record, people laugh, people joke, like, then, like, I, I don't get it. Uh, but Zion, this is off topic, but I remember Zion before he got famous. Uh, I was at Adidas, and I was playing a game, and I must have looked, we finished, and I must have looked at this other court. And I seen some some chubby black kid dunk the ball harder than I have ever seen in my life. And I was like, yo, what age group is this? So it was like 16 and under or 17. I, and I was like, bro, who is that? And then nobody know. And I must have came to the same Adidas tournament next year. And I was like, oh, that's Zion Williamson. And I was like, bro, he was going to be something the way I seen that. I've never seen a dunk like that to this day. That was off top of <laughs> Yeah, and nah, I can only imagine what he was like back then. Because, I mean, if you think about it, I look at Zion as being, like, a rare talent, like, especially at that at that level. Like, you look, think of Zion. I think of Zion. I think of Bron. I think of, like, Dwight Howard. I think of, like, Mike Beasley, you know, high school-wise. As far as just being, like, grown man, you know, physically, athletically, just not from this planet at that age, you know what I'm saying? And I, I didn't see Zion in high yeah, school, but he was crazy. I can imagine, man. He was crazy. But yeah, back to your question, though, I, I, I think social media has an effect on a lot of people, but I don't think it should have as big as an effect. Like, you, you, you play basketball, you get paid to play the game you love, like, just play it, you feel me? Say what you want to say and keep, keep it pushing. That's tough because saying what you want to say these days is costing people that could cost you money. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? That's that's a tough. I mean, don't take that literally. Don't take that literally. Don't go and don't sabotage right. yourself. But I'm saying like, if you want to say what you ate for Thanksgiving, I don't think you should right, care right. about what people say. <laughs> was like, they were on Kyrie's head for saying he don't celebrate Thanksgiving. I, mean, I, said, I said, I don't particularly celebrate, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> particularly celebrate but y'all enjoy they were on his head <laughs> they were on his head yeah. I, I couldn't imagine I've said this several times like Twitter was Twitter just started when my my junior year I think junior senior year Instagram really took off my second year overseas so I, I couldn't I couldn't imagine because I used to I, I'd be like KD for sure if I was uh, you know what I'm saying I would be I'll be responding to people being petty as hell like because I I got millions of, I would be worse than KD because I would be talking to people so high like like that Dave, that Dave Chappelle episode where talking about talking about hide the money y'all there's poor people around like, I, I'd be hitting people with that every day so. Like, cause it's just like, at some point it's like, damn, y'all over here talking to me so reckless. Like I got to respond. Like I can't, I can't just not say nothing. Yeah. Like that only lasts for so long, but I mean, good for you to, to be able to, to be able to, avoid. how do you avoid that stuff? Like what, like, I know you mentioned your family and all I mean, that. I'm not, I'm not no, I'm not no KD or nothing. It was Zion, so I don't get, I don't get that, but, uh, I don't know, bro. I just I, I like to laugh. Like I I'm, like I like to laugh. So if I see something about me, I'll probably just laugh. Uh, 
I, I like playing basketball. So, like, if you want to come play basketball and say something, like, I, I'm all for that. Like, I'm, I love to hoop. Like, I do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not about to, like, let no one say nothing crazy to my face. But if you just talk hey, about me online, wait, wait like, till you, I think it's Wait, wait till you miss a game-winning free throw or something start getting them death threats overseas. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> you going to see. That's, how, yeah. that's when it start getting crazy over there. <laughs> And, and it gets it gets the craziest when you realize the debt threat is because someone lost three hundred dollars on a bet, not even because they really care. Dude was drunk and lost three hundred dollars. Like, was it that deep? Though? Like, <laughs> was it that deep? But, but nah, man, that's dope, man. The last one we got yeah. paycheck rain check for you. Yeah, paycheck rain check, man. As we wrap up, somebody's paycheck is taking a rain check, man. And since uh, we've been on the hiatus, we're gonna cover this one from back in the day, but. uh Steve Nash obviously got fired. Um, you know, it seemed like it was kind of inevitable as KD wanted out of Brooklyn, you know, before the season. But um, I guess the question is here is how much does an unhappy superstar matter in the league? You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like whether KD's upset or not, is he still not going to go out and score 30? You know what I'm saying? So it's like what effect does having an unhappy superstar have on the team and the atmosphere? I mean, a lot. Shoot, the Nets been on some crazy stuff for a minute. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it is KD and Kyrie. So at any given point when stuff comes together, it'll come together. But I think a disgruntled superstar definitely has an effect on the team. Yeah. I think, man. A big effect. Nah, uh, no question. You saw like you saw how KD was playing. Like it to me, it's crazy. It was more crazy to see how dude was like. You thought that maybe he just wasn't playing well, but dude was really just mad and just was chilling. Because as soon as Nash got fired, he started going crazy again. Mm-hmm. And it's like, damn. I mean, like for me, it's even crazy to see the just the ability to be able to turn turn it off like that and then turn it back on. That's crazy, but I would I would even ask y'all even a step further. Like, what does being unhappy have? What effect does that have on your game? In the, like personally, like you two, we talked about before, like how important it is to find a spot overseas that you like. So, like when you're unhappy personally, like what does that do to your game? Would be my question. Man, you unhappy personally, you miss one shot, you think the world ended. Now your whole game terrible. But if you're in, like, a good place, you miss one shot, two shot, three shots, all right, let me play defense, get a board, transition, free throw. Now you look up, you got 16 and four or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's big. Personal, like, peace is big. Yeah. Basketball is an emotional sport, man. Like, you got to. It is. You know, you you could you could be feeling real good before a game. You miss five <laughs> shots in a row, you're going to start feeling – it's gonna start feeling bad after a while if that next one don't go in. You know what I mean? So, facts, you know, you, you constantly—it's an emotional roller coaster, man. And uh, so, I think it's definitely important. Have y'all ever gone through a, a phase in y'all career where being unhappy affected your work ethic? Affected you like wanting to go in the gym, or is that like a safe haven where that kind of picks you up? It definitely affected yeah. me uh, wanting to go, but I'll still go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I've had some moments where I'm like, man, it's like. Yeah, no, I had some I had some moments where I was frustrated, and then uh, I remember I just went to the gym. Like, I didn't want no trainers. I didn't want nobody rebounding. I was like, I'm going to just take it back to, like, childhood. Like, use my imagination, like, Penny versus Jordan. You That's know what I'm saying? Therapy. Like, I'm going to just take it back to yeah. the basics. And, uh, and that was, like, peaceful, and that kind of just got me back to, you know what I'm saying, that uh, – that the, the space that I needed to be in mentally. But, yeah, I think, like, sometimes, man, like I said, it's a, it's a very emotional game, a season, a career, a week. You know, everything is just, you know, it's ups and downs. You just got to find, you know, find your peace in different ways. And sometimes it's doing something completely different. 